On the 1st of August 2023, the City of Toronto publicly announced the creation of a Dutch-styled intersection in its downtown. The announcement, along with a pretty nifty video, was met with delight from local advocacy groups. But what does Dutch-styled mean exactly? Why do images of safety upgrades make people think immediately of the Netherlands? And why are so many engineers and planners so eager to brand their latest design as Dutch? The Netherlands, although being small, has a massive reputation for creating excellent and safe transportation systems. Its city centers look like this, the most popular vehicle is this, and its traffic death rate for the last 50 years has done this. But as the irritated Belgian might point out, the Netherlands isn't the only golden boy in the lobby. Denmark's capital of Copenhagen is world famous for cycling, and Danes have plenty to be proud about. German cities like Freiburg and Leipzig have tram and cycling networks that could hold their own against most Dutch cities. In fact, it might surprise you to learn that the Netherlands isn't even the best performer in Europe when it comes to traffic safety. Ranked by traffic deaths per million of inhabitants, a European Commission report in 2022 found that the Netherlands only came in ninth place out of the 27 member states of the EU. But before we get too disappointed and start unsubscribing from Dutch urbanist channels, wait just a minute. Because while the land of windmills and cheese isn't the only nation in Europe with safe bike lanes, they are absolute champions when it comes to building them everywhere. If you've been fortunate enough to visit Europe multiple times, you might notice a pattern. A popular and often touristic city center with lots of pretty buildings and museums inside of a pedestrianized zone, with easy access to public transit and a safe environment for cycling. But once you exit the downtown, that safe and enjoyable environment gives way to much more auto-oriented infrastructure. Or if you travel to multiple cities in the country, the quality of transportation can vary drastically from city to city. Sure, Leipzig in Germany is quite good for cycling, but good luck if you go to Bochum or Hagen. Breaking this pattern is where the Netherlands really stands out. It doesn't matter if you're in Amsterdam, Utrecht, Groningen, Maastricht, The Hague, or Leiden, they all have the same safe infrastructure in both the downtowns and the outer suburbs. Nor do you have to stick to the large cities. We can see the same safe systems in the small towns and villages scattered across the country, and along the rural routes linking it all together. This doesn't mean everything is perfect, but the general rule is that you must look a lot harder to find the bad than the good. So, why is the Netherlands so good at making its infrastructure uniform? It's not as simple as pointing to a single piece of legislation or telling the story of how a few forward-thinking engineers and planners managed to inspire an entire country with their vision. It'll take analyzing five fundamental components that exist independently, but when they come together, it creates a transportation system second to none. The year is 1994. The Channel Tunnel opens, Finland votes to join the EU, and in a small corner of Europe, the Dutch Parliament approves the Wegen Verkehrswet, the road and traffic law. Complementary to a new traffic code passed in 1990, these reforms were an attempt to shake things up a little bit in the nation's fight against traffic deaths. By 1985, the country had managed to cut fatalities by 56%, from an all-time high in 1972. But in the following five years, progress slowed to a trickle with a reduction of just 4%. It was becoming clear that something new was needed, a fresh approach where only a complete rethinking of traffic regulations would do. The previous strategy based on the traffic law of 1966 could really be summarized as preventing crashes by making them illegal. The default response of the traffic authorities to problems would be to amend the traffic law, so it would no longer be legally possible for problematic situations to arise. Maybe introduce a new road category, add a new regulation sign, or just add to the list of things that were prohibited. The regulators were in the driver's seat, and the engineers were playing catch-up by just implementing the newest signage or adjusting road designs to meet the latest regulations. The result was a convoluted mess of dozens of road categories that was starting to do more to confuse people than to boost safety. But the traffic reforms of 1990 and 94 changed all that by cutting regulations so aggressively 
that it could make a libertarian blush. <laughs> the overwhelming number of legally defined road categories were downsized to just three. The Erftuchungsweg, the Gebiets- und Sleutingsweg, and the Stromweg. The reduction and simplification process was so thorough that the legal text regulating traffic in the Netherlands can be held in this small book here. But the reforms didn't only remove rules. It also added new concepts and precedents, a crucial one being that the design and appearance of road infrastructure must stimulate the desired traffic behavior. This shifted the primary responsibility for traffic behavior from the regulators to the road designers. For instance, if a city wants a residential street to be calm, the traffic law defines 30 km an hour regulatory signs that can be enforced by the police and basic rules of the road. Other aspects like getting the majority to comply with the new speed limit, how to create safe behaviors at intersections, and the locations of traffic markings was going to have to be figured out by the road designers in charge of the project. Or as another example, want to create a cycle street where cars behave like guests behind the cyclist. Well, sorry bucko, there's no legal text or regulatory sign defined in the traffic law that can stop Dutch drivers from overtaking cyclists if they want to. So you'd better come up with a way to design the street to shoo away as much car traffic as you can and encourage cars to only pass in a safe manner. This new dynamic, where the government kept itself to basic traffic rules and leaving designing to the designers, changed the paradigm and revolutionized everything. Now, if you're listening from abroad and have experience with getting stonewalled by arbitrary traffic regulations, the thought of being unshackled from codebooks to chase after your most ambitious designs probably sounds pretty great, right? But transitioning to a system overnight, where you inherit most of the responsibility for driver behavior and be without the blanket support from traffic signs is not a challenge that anyone should take lightly, or alone for that matter. Dutch road designers needed to start acting less like bureaucrats for relying on arbitrary rules, and more like scientists, using data to achieve desired outcomes. To help with this transition, two organizations would step forward. The SWOV, or the Wetenschappelijk Onderzoek Verkeersveiligheid, is the primary institute for research for road safety in the Netherlands. They publish general statistics like how many road deaths and injuries occur every year in the Netherlands, to analyzing which types of travel surfaces are the most dangerous, or comparing the benefits of different kinds of intersection design. Think of the SWOV like the eyes and ears of the Dutch road system. As an independent group, their data helps paint a clear and unbiased picture of the challenges facing the transportation system. It is these insights that point designers in the correct direction to then concentrate their efforts. But if the SWOV is the eyes and ears, then the second organization, the Ser Erove, is the brain. Like the SWOV, the Ser Erove is also an independent group, but its mission is to provide empirically proven design recommendations for engineers and planners across the country. For instance, when research found that collisions with bollards was a leading cause for hospitalizations of cyclists, the Ser Erove got to work by doing a series of field tests to figure out the safest bollard setups while still being able to stop cars. Everything like the distance between bollards, illumination at night, bollard height, and the length of guidance marking was tested. The results were then bundled into a design guidance for road designers titled Evaluatie Anbefalingen for Palano Fitzpada or an evaluation for the recommendations of ballers on bike paths. This publication is available here, and can be accessed by anyone with a membership to the Serovay's technical library. Of course, ballers are just one small example. The same kind of resources exist for every aspect of the road system, like roundabouts, programming smart signals, or footpaths for pedestrians. And the Serovay's work doesn't end once the guidance is published. They need to be updated regularly, so they often collaborate with local governments to discover unexpected issues and get feedback on their designs from those who implemented them. With the joint efforts of the SWOV and the Ser Erove, Dutch road designers enjoy access to the most cutting-edge research and designs in the world, while retaining freedom to design what they want. 
The concept of retaining freedom to design what they want can pivot us to the next component of the Dutch system. Many might assume that there is a strict code defining what is and isn't legal to build on public roads in the Netherlands, but this would be incorrect. In fact, none of the design guidances in the country are legally mandatory. And on top of that, the Netherlands has no licensing system for professional engineers, chartered engineers, or any other kind of designation that gives exclusive rights to approve engineering plans. Theoretically, anybody can propose any type of design that they want. I know this might come as a surprise, but don't just take my word for it. Even the Se Aero Bay admits in their own texts that their design standards have no legal or mandatory status. A road authority could theoretically ignore them just as quickly as it took to read them. And after all, just because something is better doesn't mean everyone will use it. Just ask my native country, the United States, about the metric system. How does this contradiction exist in a place where everything seems to be so similar everywhere? I mean, how else could such uniformity in design across an entire country be possible if it's only voluntary? Surely something must be happening to explain why all these roads are so similar. Well, indeed there is. The legal concept of the responsibility of safety. Just how an airline has a legal responsibility for the safety of its passengers, or a food company has a responsibility for safety of people eating their product, traffic reforms also introduce this concept to public roads. Now the Dutch Highway Authority, the Rijksvaterstadt, would be responsible for the safety of all drivers using its highways. Or a city like Utrecht became responsible for the safety of cyclists using this bike path. However, this doesn't mean that a drunk driver who gets in a crash on a Dutch freeway can just turn around and hold the Rijksvaterstadt legally liable. Road authorities can only be held liable for crashes that are reasonably within their power to prevent. But it does hold them to account on two things, maintenance and design. For example, if a Dutch road is riddled with potholes which ends up causing an accident, the road authority absolutely could be held liable. Fixing potholes and keeping the road in good condition are reasonable things within a road authority's power to do. Another case would be if a cyclist gets injured using a dangerous crossing, when there are alternative designs proven to be safer. Since the road authority is the owner and has the power to approve the design of the facilities it operates, it also falls within their reasonable power to only approve the safest designs to protect its users. So what's a road authority manager looking to avoid bankruptcy from legal settlements to do? Invest like hell in proper maintenance and follow the design guidelines that have been empirically proven to be the safest option possible. So. While using the Ser Aero Bay isn't legally mandatory, there is one hell of an incentive. This incentive is a nifty tool, but it also has a useful companion that can block stubborn designers from causing lasting damage. Now, the Netherlands certainly isn't the only country with environmental legislation, but they do go a step further by mandating environmental targets for roads. Like noise pollution, any new or reconstructed road inside city limits needs to try to achieve 48 decibels, around the same loudness as a conversation in your home. So just to give you guys an idea, this is my voice at a con normal conversation level, and this is the loudness of the road when cars are driving on it. As you guys can see in here, it's pretty much around the same, around the 43 decibel marker. Or like air pollution. Roads can generate all kinds of toxic pollutants like PM10, particulate matter with a diameter up to 10 micrometers, small enough to enter your lungs and heart where they can cause serious health issues. Dutch law sets a strict limit for the annual average at 40 micrograms per cubic meter. So if a road authority wants to rebuild or widen a road, they must prove that it will comply with these limits or risk having the project blocked. An easy way to see this mechanism at work is by looking at the Dutch freeway system, or the Rijkswegen, on Google Maps. Notice how the freeways skirt around cities instead of blasting through the center, LA style. It's a great example of how freeways are supposed to be used, expediting trips from city to city, and not being relevant for trips inside a metro area. 
Because the environmental law allows freeways to reach up to 65 decibels in loudness, but only allows 48 decibels inside of city limits, this more or less forces road engineers to follow the Ser Arrow advice to not build freeways straight through cities. And we can see the same principle inside the cities also. Most Dutch roads are only one lane in each direction, sometimes two as we approach city limits, but never more than two. It turns out that one more lane to fix traffic, bro, is much harder to do when the widened road can only be as loud as people talking in a room. There's no way six-lane strodes can meet this requirement. Just listen to how loud this five-lane strode in North America is. So, because environmental legislation makes road widenings a non-starter, it forces local leadership to seek out alternatives that actually work, like more efficient signals, better bus connections, or more cycling. The final component for discussion isn't technical like the previous ones, but rather cultural. It's the piece of the puzzle that isn't about how to do it, but more about the why. Why was there so much motivation to reform in the first place? Why was there so much invested in research and design knowledge when it didn't happen in other nations? And why bother with such a complex systems of incentives instead of a blunt force mandatory approach? To understand this, we need to touch on the Dutch tradition of Polderpolitik. To understand Polderpolitik is to understand the geography of the Netherlands and the history of the Dutch relationship with it. As most of you probably know, a large chunk of the Netherlands landmass is under sea level elevation. There's little to worry about today about catastrophic flooding, but hundreds of years ago, the fortress that the Dutch built to protect themselves didn't exist. Most of the land was wet, marshy, and very flood prone. So the towns were developed in dry areas that were called polders. A polder is an area of land that's surrounded on all sides by raised embankments for protection from flooding akin to an empty cereal bowl placed in a sink. If major flooding happened during the storm, the surrounding countryside would flood, but the small island of civilization inside would stay dry. The obvious downside of this setup is its fragility. All it took for a polluter to fail was a single poorly built or poorly maintained section for floodwaters to punch through and turn the dry island into one giant swimming pool. Coexisting with this fragile reality would end up shaping politics in a rather particular way. In order to survive and keep their feet dry, these polders learned that they had to govern themselves in a way that allowed political participation across all classes and professions when it came to anything related to managing water. This is because polders that were run more like dictatorships ended up being much more likely to flood. After all, dictators often make decisions from their own singular assumptions and can't easily be criticized or shown the shortcoming of their decisions. When everyone has a shared interest for survival, it ended up being a far better system to let everyone's voices be heard. This long-standing tradition is how the Dutch concept of polderpolitik was born, and it continues to be relevant to this day. Nowadays, polderpolitik is emphasized even more in Dutch public spaces. It's the same commitment to reach a consensus that motivates the Dutch to come up with solutions that are good enough to satisfy everyone. Solutions that can make the streets safe, crush congestion on roads, preserve a healthy environment, and do it in a way that's affordable for the government. It was this commitment that led to the rise of each component we discussed, and then coming together to produce a system that continues to inspire people around the world every day.